Hey, welcome back to Gold's Grudge. So this video is about the silent killer, and that is water or coolant getting into your oil. And that is a silent killer because it can happen slowly over time. And before you know it, it's too late and your engine is destroyed. And I'm making this video because over time, over the years, I've seen too many engines get destroyed that way. Uh, because whoever's managing that didn't notice it until damage was done. And it, it can absolutely require your engine to be totally rebuilt. So we're going to show you how that happens. So I'm going to start by a little experiment uh, over here. I got a little bit of oil that I drained out of no oil change. I always drain the oil of the first break-in oil. That's used oil, but it's okay. We're going to pour a little water into it, okay? And we're going to come back at the end of the video and see where the water is, okay? It's probably already there almost. So water is heavier than oil. So uh, one of the things, and I'll come back to that, if you suspect you got a water leak, first of all, there's two kinds of leaks. There's external and internal. There's no such thing as a good leak, but if you're going to have one, you'd rather have it externally. Easier to fix. And if you're interested in what's going to happen next, please like and subscribe. Little sidebar, I got to mention this. So uh, every YouTuber likes to get a home run once in a while. So I turned on my YouTube channel this morning and there's a video made by the, the, the uh, channel is called Everything Homestead. I think the speaker is Terry. And he made a video eight days ago about how to catch a mouse in your shop. And he's got 189,000 views. So that's about a month and a half work for me to get 189,000 views. So congratulations, Terry. I like to subscribe to your channel. Good job. So back to work. So there's there's no such thing as a good leak, but if you're going to have an external leak, so if your water level in your engine, in your radiator is going down and you don't know where it's going, okay, you wonder what's happening. The first thing you want to do is check your oil level because there's a good chance that water is going into your oil. So if your oil level is going up and your water level is going down, uh, you probably have found the problem. Now you got to find out what you're going to do about it. The other thing is that if you look on your dipstick, and this is really a lot true with older engines before we had positive crankcase ventilation, etc., is when water and oil mixes, it makes like a milky substance. And sometimes you can even say, see evidence of that uh, just on your dipstick. So oh, one of the other checks we do whenever I'm breaking in a new engine, I just run it until it gets up to full temperature. It only takes five to 10 minutes, depending on a bunch of factors. Shut it off. I check the valves anyway, take the valve covers off. If there's anything going on with a water leak, it's going to create uh, condense on the inside of the valve covers because the outside of the valve cover is exposed to the atmosphere. So it's going to condense and leave little water bubbles then you know you got a problem. So uh, internal oil mixing with your water, mixing with your oil and ice. Once again, water, I'm talking about uh, coolant. Usually it's you know something like this, pressed on or whatever, glycol, antifreeze. Typically it's mixed with your water and up here in the North country, uh, we, uh, typically mix it 50-50 and that protects us to minus 32 degrees Fahrenheit. So that's pretty good protection because most cars aren't outside in that temperature, but it is good protection. But the, the glycol or antifreeze also protects your engine from rusting, etc. You don't want to use pure water. The only engines that need to use pure water is a race car engine. And why is that? Because if you have a leak on the track, Glycol is almost impossible to remove. So water, uh, your, all engines are required to use water on a racetrack. Anyway, a little bit of sidebar. So back to the problem. Uh, you find that your water level is going down, your oil level is going up. One of the first things you can do after pulling your dipstick is uh, go to your uh, drain plug and don't take it out. Just loosen it so that it leaks. Put a clear plastic container. So look, we got results already. Here's what happens, okay? You can look and see the water has already gone to the bottom. Water's heavier than oil, and it doesn't take that long to go to the bottom. So if you go to your drain plug and loosen your drain plug, don't take it out. Use a container about that size. That's clear. Let it drain out. 
take a look and see what you got. If there's water in there, you got a problem and you got to take care of it right now because it's going to destroy your engine. First mode of failure is uh, what happens is the water mixes with the oil when the engine's running, your crankshaft's like an egg beater, so it mixes it up nice and pumps it through the engine. And the first thing that'll go if you have a flat tap of camshaft is your camshaft. So, and even roller camshafts will fail if you have water in the oil. And the next thing is, of course, if you've got water and oil mixed in your bearings, uh, your bearings are gonna start failing too. So it will destroy your engine over time. And if you're not paying attention, by the time you notice, it's gonna to be too late. So. Uh, one of the other ways we know, so if, if you have the, you know you got a leak, you got your valve covers off, you found condensation on the inside of your valve cover, now you got to find out where it's coming from. So where are the possible causes? A head gasket could be leaking, uh, the intake manifold, the intake manifold connection to the uh, cylinder heads could be leaking at that point, it'll go down your, uh, your valley, uh, your lifter valley and find its way to the bottom. Uh, one of the things we've uh, had previous engine and I, my diagnosis uh, convinced me and uh, lots of other people, we had an engine that I had to rebuild and the owner uh, of it had a water leak and when typically if you have a car that's stored, you shut it off, right, over the winter. So when you shut it off, so the temperature is 200 degrees Fahrenheit in the water, the pressure is 15 or so PSI of pressure in the system and you shut it off and a little bit of water drains down it gets lands right in your lifter valley fills your lifter bore up with water gets in between your lifter and your lifter bore and it sits there for probably six months in the winter while you're not driving the car and when you start it up that lifter is not going to turn and you're going to have a camshaft failure and we've actually had a case where that's exactly what's happened so uh one of the other ways to do, if you have a tester, I have a tester like this. So one of the things, quality checks I do on a braking of an engine after I run it for the first five minutes is pressure test the water system. So this thing just bolts onto the, or connects onto where your, where your cap usually goes. And we can pump whatever pressure you want. In this case, I have a 15 pound cap, which means this system is running at 15 PSI, okay? And so I'll pump it up to 15 PSI and watch for the gauge to leak down. And if it leaks down, then I know water's getting into the oil. So where is it going? So if you have the valve covers off, some engines, including small block chevs, and a lot of other chevs too, the head bolts, 17 on each side, bolt into the block where there's water on the other side. So any interface where water meets oil can be a potential leak. So those head bolts have to be sealed when they're installed and torqued. Uh, but if they leak, if you pressurize the system, you need to have pressure because it won't leak if you don't. Pressurize the system with the valve covers off. You should be able to see the water coming up. It'll land in the valley of the cylinder head. Little wee droplets, not much, but over time it'll do a lot of, a lot of damage. So that's one way to check it. Um, if it's your cylinder heads and you got work to do, intake manifold is a good possibility as well. And uh, that's pretty much most of the interfaces where water meets oil. So how does your system work, by the way? So you have a water pump that pumps into your block on both sides, and then you have connections from your block to your head, and it goes up through the head and back up to the intake manifold and back out to the rad, it goes into the top of the rad hot, as hot as it, is going to be and at the bottom of the rad it's cooled the rad is just a heat exchanger okay and with a fan the help of a fan or the movement of the car it takes heat out of the water water or cooling is just a medium to take heat away from the engine uh, where it can be extracted somewhere else so uh, water takes heat the, the heat comes out of the water goes back in and does it again so uh, one of the things, if you have a very, very minor leak, what can happen when the engine is at operating temperature, the boiling point of water is 212 degrees. If, if your temperature is high enough, uh, that water will evaporate and your PCV valve will actually uh, take most of it away or some of it away, but that's not a good uh, situation. So 
By the way, I mentioned water boils at 212 degrees Fahrenheit. So if you're in Australia or England, that's 100 degrees Celsius. Okay. And going back to the Fahrenheit scale, if you have 15 PSI, this cap is a, called a 15 PSI cap. And what that means is the cap is a pressure relief valve. If the pressure gets over 15 pounds, that spring will, will collapse and let a little bit of pressure out of the system. So if it's at 15 PSI, the boiling point of water is 250 degrees. If you have a 20 pound cap, so your system's operating at 20, it's 258 degrees. Most race cars operate 24 or 25 PSI uh, pressure, typically high pressure. As long as water is, the, the coolant is still liquid, it's still taking heat out of your engine. Okay, so once it turns to a gas, it's not very effective at taking heat out of your engine and you're going to basically destroy it by overheating. Going back to the external leaks, radiator could be leaking, the heater hoses could be leaking, the radiator, the rad hoses could be leaking. It could be just a matter of tightening, you know, tightening up a, a clamp or something. But typically those water leaks are easy to find because they're going to drip down on your shop floor or your pavement and you look back up and see where they came from. So those are the main points, something to be aware of. Uh, I'm sure there's people watching this video right now that have this issue that don't know it. And that's why I'm making it. It's an easy thing to check and keep your eye on. And if you don't have a problem, that's great. But if you do, you need to take care of it uh, right away because over time it can do a lot of damage. So hope you found that helpful. And uh, going back to liking and subscribing. So I got, I said Terry, I commented on Terry's Everything Homestead video. Great video. Congratulations on eight days, 189,000. So how does that work? So YouTube or Google's pretty smart. They know how to figure out if you have a good video or not. And the ways they know are how long you watch the video, uh, how many people click on it, of course, how long you watch the video, whether you like or subscribe, whether you comment, or whether you share. If you do all those things, it's a home run for whoever made the video because YouTube will say, boy, they like, somebody likes it. Let's show it to a bunch more people. And that's how your channel can grow. So if, if you take that little hint, you can help me out with that. I appreciate it. And I don't know if we'll ever get 189,000 views in eight days, but uh, we'll keep digging. A couple of information items. We talked about doing the, the uh, dyno tests using our budget build engine with multiple carburetors and multiple combinations of air filters. So here's a tentative schedule that I made up. It will take to the dyno. It may change by the time we get there. And Michael put a screenshot. We're going to start off by using carburetors. We're going to get the engine tuned in the first couple of pulls. And uh, then we're going to start off with the Holly carburetor, Quadrajet carburetor, uh, Elderbrock carburetor, Elderbrock carburetor, and a Carter AFB carburetor. And then whatever the best carburetor is, we're going to go to the next series of tests and try air filters. We're going to try a one inch, a two inch, a three inch, and then we're even going to if I can find one, I haven't found one yet, go back to the old OEM style uh, filter that we showed in our previous video with the snorkel on it and just see if that hurts performance. So lots of interest in that. Mike will put a screenshot of this. If you got more suggestions, there is some limitation to how much we can do, by the way. We're going to have a long day on the dyno trying to do all that. And we'll do our best to give you uh, an objective outcome. You know, there's lots of, I have a theory. I've done some, created a formula for you. I mentioned the guys that did the, uh, flow, on the flow bench, measured the flow on the flow bench. But the whole purpose of doing all this is to make power. So when you go to the dyno, that's the end result. That's what matters. The dyno doesn't lie. And that's what you need to know. So watch for that. Um, another thing about racing, uh, people have asked me how our racing went. So, uh, Two, I'm involved in two kinds of racing. So up north in northern Ontario, at Sault Ste. Marie, my son raced his modified, uh, and I built the engine for it. So he got in five races uh, in four weeks by the end of the year. And in five races, he got two firsts, two seconds, and a third. So his average finish is 1.8. Not bad. Uh, we're actually going to bring that engine back here. Now it's got an adjustable camshaft, cloys adjustable timing gear on it. And they're going to re-dyno it and try some different settings. What we're trying to accomplish 
is uh, because you have limited traction, the car, the car's got a way much more power and torque than the tires can handle. So softening the power in the corners and getting that power back at top end, we're going to try, the obvious thing is to retire the camshaft and see what happens. So the other side is locally, I'm involved in, I'm on the crew of Trevor Culver. So last Friday at exactly the same time as my son was racing, Trevor won his fourth in a row. That's five out of seven features so far this year. So pretty nice year for winning races, but it's still, Trevor is running for the championship points. We've got three more races to go and it's still a pretty tight race. Even though he's won lots of races, he's got guys right on his heels. So I will see what happens there. One other point that, especially if you're in Canada and especially if you're in Ontario, uh, like and I were just discussing, there's a major police investigation going on uh, in Ontario right now, and they have discovered 60 cars that have been repossessed by the by the police. I guess it's provincial police, been repossessed because the buyers bought them, paid for them legitimately went through the buyers and sellers package and all that, thought they did everything right. And they found out that the seller didn't own them. So they just get, they just come with a trailer and take your car away. And guys, there's lots of sad stories, guys that spent thousands of dollars on these cars, paid for them in the first place. And they just take your car away because the seller didn't own it. So two things, make sure your car doesn't get stolen. That's number one, because you could be the victim on that side of it. Next side, if you buy a car, uh, especially if it's a restored collector classic car, do your homework, do your checks to make sure the seller legitimately owns it. Even though they followed all these processes, we got some pretty sad cases here of guys who spent lots of money and they're heartbroken. Not only they don't have their money, they don't have their car. So just a word out there for anyone uh, aware of that. You can, I'm sure if you live in Canada, you can Google that and find more information on it. But uh, just making you aware. I make sure mine's locked up nice and tight every night. Thank you for watching Gold Scratch.